In Peru, a nationalist revolution is brewing. Many indigenous people, the descendants of the Incas, want to reject Western capitalism. Nationalist groups are growing in power, among them extremists. These are the Christian nationalists who are explaining their policies to the people here, saying that globalization and the world banking system has turned Peruvians into slaves. For 500 years, a white elite has controlled Peru's wealth. That control is now under threat. We were in the slums that encircle Lima, the capital of Peru. Because the police don't go where we're going, we're bringing an armed guard because it's very dangerous. For the slum dwellers, crime is the biggest issue. Cost cutting has reduced the police force by a quarter in recent years. We went to La Ventanilla neighborhood. The people here have no running water, no sanitation, and little electricity. We're going out on the local neighborhood watch. This is the only protection they have since the police tend not to venture in here. So some of the neighbors walk around here to make sure that the drunks and the drug addicts from the hill don't come in here. We were met by Gladys Flores Romero, a mother who has set up a neighborhood patrol. The volunteers blow whistles to alert thieves they're on guard. But Gladys said, despite their work, their houses are constantly robbed. Their children are frequently attacked. Her little daughter was raped by five people. Susan is 10. Gladys told me that Susan was raped in 2004. Hola, Susan. Susan, can you tell me who attacked you? What happened? Cinco fumones iba with me, 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 she said five drug addict smokers came to her bed and then I was taken to hospital and on the way back I fainted. She said the boys who raped me are up there in that sand dune. She said three of them have been sent to prison because of the attack on her daughter. Two of them are still at large. She said they were 18, 19, one of them was 30. Why don't you go to school now? She said she doesn't want to go to school because the other children know that she's been raped and they call her a raped girl and two of them try to abuse her. Two of Susan's friends have also been raped. All around Lima, the descendants of the Inca live in the slums. There is no law here. Neighbors take justice into their own hands. Last year, 1,900 people were lynched. We met Gladys again, and her 16-year-old daughter, Cecilia. She said there are lots of people up here at night taking cocaine paste and lots of women have been raped up on that hill and also down there every night someone is raped, she said, so there's no security for women. She said people like these guys come from other areas and then they come into their houses and rob them. Drug addiction is endemic. We met two of the addicts who terrorize the neighbors. They smoke cocaine and rob to feed their habit. 
these two men said they would talk to us on the condition that we got them a plate of food because they haven't eaten yet today. If the poor have nothing and you're the poor, you live in a poor area, why do you steal here? Why don't you go to Miraflores and rob from the rich? No, hay mucho, mucho, mucho policía, seguro. Policía? ¿Y aquí? ¿Dónde está la policía? They said they cannot go to the rich area of Miraflores and rob from the well-off because there are too many police and they'd be taken prisoner immediately. Whereas here, there are no police, so they can rob from anyone. Aquí, ciudad perdida. This, they say, is a lost city, a forgotten city. Four years ago, President Alejandro Toledo was sworn in. Gladys campaigned for a president who promised to eradicate poverty. She runs this soup kitchen, one of the government's initiatives. Most of these children are orphans or abandoned. For some, this is their only daily meal. The problem is, the food delivered for one month lasts for just two weeks. When Gladys heard the president was meeting soup kitchen mothers, she said she'd like to ask him for more food. Since Susan was attacked, Gladys takes her daughters everywhere. Today, President Toledo is meeting people like Gladys who run dining rooms, but they're activists from his own party. Because he's not popular in Gladys' area, she hasn't been invited, but she's going to go anyway to see if she can ask for some more help. As international press, we were let in. We took Susan, but Gladys had to wait outside. The president was inaugurating a new soup kitchen program with EU funding. President Toledo is Peru's first indigenous leader. His election brought hope. They're talking about poverty, how to combat it, and what a good job they're doing, and how with these dining rooms they're feeding the poor. Toledo promised a million jobs, but he hasn't delivered. Now he's the most unpopular president in Latin America. We wanted to ask him why the soup kitchens weren't getting enough food. President. But he wasn't giving interviews that day. He understands English. He speaks very well. We spent the rest of the day in the safe middle class area of Lima. It was like a holiday for the family, a rare outing from the slums, especially for Susan. She said she loves Susan. She loves to see her having such a good time, and she wants to ask me if maybe I could adopt her with my partner and take her away from here. I realized just how desperate Gladys was when she offered to give away the daughter she adores. But poverty leads to desperate measures. In Lima, relatives of reservists who'd staged a rebellion against the president waited to glimpse their faces among prisoners being transferred outside the courthouse. On New Year's Day, 150 insurgents seized the police station in Andahuaylas, a small town in the Andes. Their leader, Antaro Umala, is a retired army major. His followers were former soldiers. Their aim? To topple the president. Four policemen and two rebels were killed. The siege ended in surrender. We went to meet the father of the man who'd led the rebellion. Isaac Umala is a lawyer and the rebel's ideologue. His struggle is for the Inca descendants that he calls the copper people. La regencia, el dominio, el mando, el poder extranjero ha sido totalmente nocivo. He said the Americas used to belong to the copper people, but now 60% of the area is occupied by whites, Canada, North America. El movimiento nacionalista piensa... He says 500 years ago, the Spanish colonizers lobotomized Inca culture. Quiero que se reincorpore la raza cobriza. 
they came and they exterminated the indigenous people. In the countries where this 40% of copper people are in the majority, they're not in government, and that's what they want. They want to return to power. Entonces, en Andinoamérica, el poder se toma por elecciones y por golpe de estado de masas. He said the way they should take power is either through elections or through a mass coup. The people come out, they protest, they get rid of a government, but then a new government replaces them. And this government has the interests of the people at heart. We traveled into the Andes, the ancient Inca heartland, to search for relatives of the rebels. Here, 20 years ago, the Shining Path, a leftist Maoist group, fought a guerrilla war against the state. 69,000 people were killed. Most are indigenous people, innocents trapped in the fighting. In the village of Pukara, a judge was exhuming two bodies. Dionysia was waiting to identify the clothes of her husband and son. They'd been executed by the army 15 years ago. He said the trajectory of the bullet was from right to left, and you can tell from the way it entered that the men, that the man was forced to kneel down when he was shot. Next, Dionysia's son Raul was exhumed. He was 22 when shot, a farmer like his father. After the funeral, most of the family had run away to Lima. Only Dionysia stayed. She showed me a photo of her husband, Paulino, holding Raúl. Has the situation here changed much since your, your husband and son were shot? No hay quien haga que mi esposo me sembrábamos nosotros. Ya no puedo sembrar lo que tengo poquito siquiera. She said things have got worse than 15 years ago, that now people are still fearful. A lot of people have fled from here and they've moved to other places. They are very poor. Their situation is worse than 15 years ago financially. They, there are no jobs. They can barely survive on what they can grow here. They're going to put her husband's body back into his grave, just wrapped in this plastic, and she's begging them, please, put him in a coffin. We reached Tacna, a city where many of the rebels in the January uprising had lived. We'd arranged to meet the wife of one of the insurgents. Hola. Basilia has five children and no job. In Peru, no work. So, for the motives that the Mr. President is not selling our, 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 she said people say that her husband and his fellows are terrorists, but it's not true. It was because of the poverty here and the lack of jobs that they rose up, and the country has been sold to foreign companies. There's no life for the Peruvian people, and what are they to do? And it's for these reasons that her husband fought. Since the arrests, relatives of the rebels have gathered every day in the town square. These are mothers, wives and children of reservists that took part in the rebellion. The crowd shouted, freedom, long live the people. They waved the flag of the Inca nation. Waiting to speak was a new group, the Christian nationalists. They have consciously adopted German Nazi-style uniforms. They want foreign companies out and Peru to be left to the indigenous people. They are anti-US, anti-capitalist and anti-Jewish. They were here to gather support for their version of nationalism. The people in the audience were willing to listen to them. He said the country is prepared to listen to this group because nobody else is listening to them. There's a real sense of desperation everywhere we've been in Peru. People tell us the same stories. There are no jobs, there's no money, there's no health care. They're desperate, they don't know what to do. They talk about starvation. They're looking for a political alternative, but they don't know what that should be because everything they've had here has failed them and they don't know where to look now. 
Pero el banco sabiendo eso, te dice, firma acá. We went to meet Ricardo Di Spirito, leader of the Christian Nationalists. Sí, por supuesto. Pasaporte, sí. Cruz. His group is targeting youngsters. No sabe qué edad tiene. A ver qué pasa en las nenas. He teaches a course in public speaking to children and they're signing up for it. Me gusta. ¿Qué tal un beso para el tiempo? De Spirito denies being a racist, but it's not for nothing he's been called the Hitler of Tacna. Orden. Limpieza. Puntualidad. Responsabilidad. Deseo de superación. They're standing here to tell us what the commandments of their group are. Order, cleanliness, punctuality, responsibility, and a desire to better oneself. De Spirito invited us onto his daily three-hour radio program. A Peruvian journalist also joined us. It was the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So the Spirito chose his group symbol, an Inca letter, because of its similarity to a swastika. You're wearing a symbol of national pride on your arm. It's an indigenous symbol. But the way you wear it, it brings to mind a Nazi swastika which represents the murder of six million Jews and other people. Don't you think it's an extremely bad taste to wear the symbol like that? He wasn't having any of it. He says, how do I know that six million Jews were killed? And what does it matter? Everyone goes on about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. What about his own ancestors who were killed? Ten million more. The Spanish killed them like dogs. He said, who cares about what happened to the Jews? What he wants to talk about is what happened here, and he wants the British audience to know what happened to his ancestors. Cortaban a nuestros hermanos. Sí, y con la sangre los hacían correr y los perros los mordían cazando. He said that 10 million of his ancestors were killed like dogs by the Spanish. That was their Holocaust. So he doesn't see why we have to go on about the Jews. That's not important to them. What does it matter here? I mean, let's just think of it like this. Why, how many, how many Jews do you think were killed in the Holocaust? Do you think any were killed? Do you deny that there was a Holocaust of Jews? And why can't you show compassion for these people because the same thing happened to your ancestors? Hay que tener, sí, compasión con los millones de peruanos que están muriéndose por culpa de los intereses de banqueros que como los israelíes les roban el dinero al pueblo. He said, why should he have compassion for the Jews and their Holocaust? Because of the Jews and because of the IMF, 15 million Peruvians live in poverty. And this is the fault of Jewish Israeli banks who charge 30% interest that can never be paid. People are being thrown out of their houses. He blames the Jews for killing Peruvians. So therefore, why should he care about the Holocaust? There are 11 Holocaust survivors in Peru. We went to meet one of them. Herz Litmanovich was experimented on by Nazi doctors. His tattoo is small because he was only 11 when taken to Auschwitz. He came to Lima in 1952, married a Peruvian and had four children. Before retiring, Herz worked in an electrical shop. He never expected to see these images in Peru. ¿Quiénes han explotado a los peruanos? Los peruanos. Ellos están explotados por los peruanos, todas las, las grandes empresas. Eso no es ningún secreto. The Jews don't exploit the people. He said the Peruvians are exploited by other Peruvians. He said by the government, which is a capitalistic government, by the big bosses who are Peruvian. There are only 3,000 Jews in the country. Pero los judíos somos, hay, hay 3,000 en total. He said the Jews didn't run Peru's economy. He says there are just 3,000 Jews in the country. 500 of them are kids who are in school. The rest are old people. A few of them are working. Some of them own big businesses. He says then there are others who have nothing. 
todavía le regalan eh, algún dinero, le dan algún trabajo, algo, entonces está perfectamente neutralizado, introducido. He said the Peruvian farmers and peasants are very easily swayed. They don't have much. It's very easy to manipulate them. We cross the border into Bolivia, the birthplace of indigenous nationalism. We headed for La Paz, Bolivia's administrative capital. The Inca revolution is spreading across the Andes. Indigenous people in Bolivia are making common cause with those in Peru. Invierten in Bolivia. ¿Cuánto invierten? Un dólar. Para llevarse cuánto? Diez dólares. He said, who owns the country? The foreigners. They come here, they invest, they take everything. For one dollar they invest, they take ten dollars out of the country. They get rich at our expense. We have everything and we're so poor. Pensamos primeramente coger el poder para para los aymaras quechos he said we want to form our own empire and form an indigenous nation stretching all the way across south america and some people may laugh and say it's a dream it's a joke but it's my dream and it was the dream of che guevara the hidden plans of the imperial zionists franceses holandeses portugueses se quisieron repartir el mundo saying that Jews have come here and taken de, de, de land Hitler, and businesses and they have great power. He says it's not just the Jews, it's everybody. It's the Yankees, the North Americans, the Croatians, the Italians, the French, the Spanish. Everybody has come to take their part of South America. We went to meet Felipe Quispe. He was the first indigenous leader to spread internationalism across the Andes. He explained how the Inca movement evolved. Marx and Lenin and Trotsky and all of these revolutionaries who fought for liberation of the masses, of course their ideas are at the bottom of ours, but we had to change things because nobody here has ever heard of these people. They don't understand their ways. Entonces, ya que no escuchan, hablaremos de Tupac Katari, hablaremos de Tupac Amar, hablaremos de Laillo. Instead we talk about revolutionary heroes that they know about, like Tupac Amaro, or we talk about their Inca ancestors, and then the people are curious, and they put their hands up and say, well, how did our ancestors confront the Spanish? What was it like? So then we have won their attention. O sea que tomar el poder por esa vía, eso quiere decir que es por la vía revolucionaria, por la vía armada. This is the only way that we can come to power, and that is armed revolution. And it's not going to happen tonight or tomorrow, but we're going on with this process and we're getting there. For the last two decades, the indigenous people of the Andes were promised that democracy and capitalism were the way to progress. They no longer believe it. Ancient Inca heartland to search for relatives of the rest.